did you ever want to be a clinical psychologist or that changed along the way? Uh, I knew that um, in secondary school. Uh, before I wanted to be a farmer. With the you wanted to be... <laughs> 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 Why a farmer with the sheep? I don't know, somehow, something about the sheep. You, yeah. you, like, you like them? Yeah, I like them. I like the... Yeah, I like the the contact with nature. I like the the white spaces. I like the um, those kind of things. I like. So, so what changed your mind? I mean, did you have many ships and they're like, okay, cool, now I'm done with ships. And <laughs> I, I guess I was able to do both at one point, um, but having ships in town is a bit difficult. Yeah, that's true. But then, why clinical psychologist? I found it fascinating how I think the same way as you did. I find it fascinating how the mind can also shape someone's response to something happening to them, um, the resilience, and also uh, what can move someone to do um, terrible acts. Um, and I, I needed to understand that um, when I was in secondary school, it was um, also um, after uh, the genocide that was perpetrated here in in. in against the two seas and I wanted to really understand in order for me to to get a better grip on what it means to be human, what it means, you know, in terms of humanity, what you know, the emotions, the impact of emotions. Mm. I think emotions have a very, very important role in our lives. It can be um ferment uh, in French they say ferment but ferment, but um um, um, you know, the ingredient that you can put in bread so that it rises mm. um, or in yogurt so that it it, it gels. Yeah. Um, isn't that? It was there. It's yeast. Yeast, yes. yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeast. It, it can be, I think emotions are really important yeasts component of someone's um, life and strength and um, energy and all of that. I think it's very, very Key, more than knowledge um and um I, i've always been interested in i think this is where also i, I joined the studies is that what are, what are the yeasts that you give your children at the very beginning so that you know uh, their bread rises as they grow up it, it, it's based on which yeast um is it based on courage, love, uh, hopefulness, uh, uh, wonder uh, of what the world has to offer, or is it based on something else? Whatever it is, it's going to to make the bread rise in a certain way. And those are really intense questions for a secondary school kid. Mm, mm. <laughs> Why were you thinking those questions during that time? I mean, is there anything that made you start thinking about them? Mm. Yeah, I think... Uh, Yeah, I, th I think as I said, um, um, we, we were going through, um, the, the country was going through a, a, mm. a very um, troubled uh, time. And, uh, and just and speaking about the Rwandan genocide. Yes, the, 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 the genocide against the Tusis yeah, here. And, and, and uh, it was um, the incapacity of understanding. You know, when, when uh, we heard... Um, bombs and and fires here um i remember feeling very old because i in my little head at the time i thought we i used to hear about world one world two and these were things for grandmothers and somehow i made the, the connection that now i was also in a way in the same category as my grandmothers who went through the same thing because i thought or the way it's being taught in in the school is that you know there were wars and then there were agreements and then now was, you know peace and it seemed to me like it's something that needs to, are things that should be resolved by adults and you know i'm trying to understand about the why and the why of many many things the why of the fears the why of but why is it yeah, why is it this way? And then afterwards, how can people commit such things? What brought them there? Um, what brought them there? What brought them there? And yeah. It's an intense experience. Mm -hmm. So how did the experience affect you? 
I think it. I think even in ways that you don't even realize. I think it's not me. It's everyone here, um, and even for generations to come, it's going to affect them. Or even is here in in ways that we don't realize that it's affecting us. Um, I, I won't even be able to to tell. But I think um, just the understanding of the world and what is possible and what is necessary to build for something to happen and not to happen is uh, these were important questions that uh, that stayed in, on my mind i'm sure in, in many in a lot of people's mind afterwards and the realization also you know of, of um how things were built after that you know talking about yeast what were the yeast um that were necessary for this country to be rebuilt in such a short amount of time with um, such a vision of um, wanting to to be hopeful to 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 offer the best to the next generations what are the the yeast that were there for me these are important questions I see emotions almost like atoms of our human beings, mental beings. Emotions are more, almost like the atoms of, you know, everything that are going to be structured around. Mm, but isn't it scary the extent of what humans can do? And Especially with this particular experience. I mean, both the good and the bad things. Yeah. Of course it's scary. Mm-hmm. You said, you know, one of the questions was, you know, thinking as to why people would be able to do such things. Mm. I mean, did you find answers to that? Um, well, what I what struck me, for me, from what I understood is it doesn't happen in a go. Um, in my understanding, it took about three generations to have that full-on total genocide to be able to happen. And it took three generations also at school of education, early childhood education of pitting people against each other, of um, desensitizing children to the pain of others, of desensitizing parents to the pain t- pains of others, um, and it, it's not something that you can do on such a large scale in one generation. I think it takes two or three generations to happen. And um, and it, I think unless you have strong, strong um, beacons in your mind that can help you counter that, um, it's easy if if you're surrounded by those kind of structures, it's it's easy to put someone into that mindset after three generations, I feel. For our listeners who, you know, um don't understand, you know, the 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 history of the genocide against the Tuts in Rwanda, do you mind briefing them a little bit about it? You're putting <laughs> now now it's a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just just very briefly, so they can understand the extent of the experience that you had gone through during that time. Mm-hmm. So, in 1994, uh, from April um, for 100 days, we had um, the 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 onset of um, of uh, a genocide that uh, would claim over the, a million lives of people in a hundred days and um, just based on the um, what they call the ethnicity of of, 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 of the people um, and an ethnicity that was um, that was fixed uh, during the colonial times based on ideology of the colonial uh, structures at the time and um so i think also one of the particularity here in rwanda is um as opposed to other genocides is that it was stopped but other rwandans it wasn't stopped by foreign powers actually the foreign powers left uh, people to their own um 
fatal destinies when they had the chance to do something about it. And the UN was here and they left. So that, of course, was not what I'm saying about the three generations. That was something that was extremely well prepared. People had lists of names of people that needed to be killed um, down to the, the children. Um, people knew where to um, put barrages, uh, blockades. People had been um, furnished with um, weapons. Um, they were grouped into, you know, different leaders uh, that would commit and then they would need to report on the people who were killed. So it was extremely efficient. And prior to that, there were trainings. Uh, prior to that, there had been sensitization within the schools um, of children um, um, that grew up to become uh, the killers later on. Um, there were sensitization within churches. Um, there was so it was an ambiance of things. And before that, there were even uh, structural um, um, measures that had been taken in terms of the number of. Tutsis, for example, who were allowed to go study at universities um, beyond secondary school, things like that, or to have even access to certain positions, certainly not uh, at the government level. Uh, so, and we had a lot of people who had been pushed away and had to leave, had to leave the country starting in 59, already where the massacres had already started happening. But what I believe really is that um, those kind of uh, power structures that push one um, group to to um, vilif vilify another is really a power structure that is looking for their own um, power and to to try to justify their incapacity to bring a better life to their people by just finding a scapegoat group and finding a, a group that can be used to to uh, to justify this lack of opportunity, lack of everything, because you know, in so many years, and if you look at this, so little few years, in so little few years, what was able to happen here, just because of the will of you know the the power in place to make something out of this country for their people, it's, the difference is is, uh, is striking. Yeah, the difference is striking. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was it was a horrible experience. It was, and I mean, and I think well, that that was you know okay. This is the scariest things that humans can do to each other. And then after that, I think people got to learn the other side of things. It's like, well, in as much as you know, this is how you know, this is the extent of what people can do to hurt others, and then the extent of you know now that you know trying to rebuild after that. I mean, I think it shows that humans are capable of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, good things included. Mm -hmm. And I think, and now we're going into a very different discussion, but I think also what is very painful is not only there's the perpetrator, there's the victim, but there's also the, the people who are looking and not doing anything. In many cases, even in, in abuse uh, and and things like that, you know, what can be even more hurtful is the fact that you notice that no one was the people who were watching and not doing anything, or not saying anything, and they had the power to do something. Could have it. the power to do something. Yeah. And well, so why do you think the people who could do something about it will just sit aside and watch? <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to ask them but uh, but but i think in terms of uh, if we we scale it down to mm -hmm. to um to uh to something that can happen to you and me i don't know i don't know 